Uh, well, that was awkward. <laughs> we definitely need to add some music to that video clip. We need to add some music to that. <laughs> I was like, yeah. Well, uh, welcome everybody to another episode of Dev Beard yeah. Ops. And uh, yeah. with myself and uh, Dark over here, who just did us a nice new intro clip. Uh, yeah, I, I was and, playing uh, around there, like trying to make a video clip, but apparently I forgot the sound. So. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> It's, and it's so weird. We're, we're sitting here like we can't talk to each other because it mutes the audio. So we're just like, <laughs> <laughs> let's see if it goes live. But in any case, um, I copied Darko today. He had on a very festive shirt. So I decided I needed to whip out my uh, nice shirt over here to match him. But uh, yeah. Darko, tell our viewers, uh, after you've welcomed them, um, what we are talking about today. Okay, so um, everybody, welcome to well the Wednesday edition of Beer, uh, Dev Beard Ops, um, where we get to talk today about um, the thing that says it below, uh, what is serverless, right? So we're going to try to talk about it. Now, of course, I, I'm, I'm sure plenty of you know exactly what serverless is or if I work with serverless, but we're going to have a discussion today. What is serverless? Um, is it just a Lambda function? Um, what things are serverless? And... Maybe how can you move things to become serverless? So we, we're going to have this, this lovely discussion today. So um, uh, I would like to welcome everybody. Welcome to the stream. By the way, this stream happens every Wednesday at the same time. So 1, 1 p.m. Central European time where uh, this this gentleman and myself um, come on stream and talk about technology, the cloud, AWS, and, and anything in between. Um, it is a very unstructured stream. So we like your cooperation. Like, please join us. Please tell us what you think. Please chat with us, uh, give us questions. We are open to all of those things. So um, welcome to everybody new and welcome to all the returning uh, folks. Before we start, um, as the tradition states, is our audio okay? So are the levels between <laughs> Kobus and myself okay? Uh, so just wait, so, so we can be sure of, of that. Yes. So do let us know. And I, and I would do a clap check, except my noise filtering filters out the clap, which is hilarious. <laughs> yeah, so- Found um, that out with recordings. As long as yeah. none of us is like too loud or too soft, so just so we can just kind mm. of balance it out, so you don't have to you don't have to teeter totter with a with a volume knob between our, ourselves talking. So <laughs> that would be fun. Also, if I every now and again do a sudden like take back like this, is because my mic is very, very in front of my face today. I got a new micro, uh, microphone arm and I haven't positioned it correctly yet, so it's like about this far from my nose. I'm like, yeah, what's this thing? And it looks like a little mouse, in case you're wondering, you can see a little gerbil. Uh, <laughs> I must say, I, I've actually replaced my microphone arm last week, no, two weeks before. And I, I went from a very simple, cheap, like a you know standard microphone arm to getting this um, better one, the Rode one. The biggest thing about this is it's much longer and it's much more, uh, mm. it's easier to, it's easier to, to, to manage. So, uh, thank you, Eric, for confirming the sound is okay. Thank you. Uh, that's awesome. all we need. <laughs> also do yes. tell us know where you, where you are joining us from. We like to know where the, where the folks are. Um, so it's, it's always great to see, always great to see, um, the, the diversity and, and, the, and the geographical distribution of the people joining mm. us on stream. We are streaming this live yes. on Twitch and YouTube. And I think, are we doing this on, there's even Periscope. Thing on Periscope. <laughs> yes. We actually have some people watching on Periscope. Yeah, if Periscope I'm is looking at the stats correctly. Yeah. <laughs> well, we, we, we stream everywhere. Okay. Yeah. But let's dig into today's topic. So as you can see here below us, it's a very fun one, which is, uh, what is serverless? Um, yeah. And the reason we want to chat about this is that often we have a conversation with people and when we start talking serverless, they say, oh, you mean AWS Lambda? We're like, yes, and? And, and. The, the and part is what we want to dig into today. So, Darko, what is serverless? Uh, so there's an actually a, 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 a definition on the AWS website, which I, I didn't look up. Uh, I know that there is one that I should be using, but in general, a serverless is more than just your compute model. It's more than like um, moving your applications from a server or a container to to something that doesn't have server, right? Um, it's more than that. It's an operational model. It's a it's a it's a place where number one, you don't have to manage any infrastructure. So when I say I don't have, you don't have to manage it. You don't have to care about the operating systems. You don't have to care about patching, provisioning to an extent, uh, I don't know, backing up and, and on making it highly available. So that's kind of a, the, the operational model is serverless. Mm. But on top of that, um, one of the, one of the, one of the big aspects of serverless is this definitive 
pay as you go. So instead of having a, a serverless thing that sits there and has idle time, you literally pay for exactly the amount of use, right? So if you have a Lambda function sitting behind an API gateway, you only pay for the amount of Lambda invocations. So the amount of time people call your application, um, this is the basically the, how much you pay. You have no, you know, have no server or a virtual machine or a container sitting somewhere just costing you money, even though it's not being, uh, it's not uh, even it's not being used. So yeah. Yeah, and also just quickly, they just it's the invocation and the duration. The yeah, duration invocation and duration. Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But cool. basically, yeah. like the amount of time, yeah. Uh, yeah. as long as it's used. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the idea here is like, if it's not in use, it means that you're not paying for it. Um, sure. But we will be touching on some of the well serverless services out there. So one which might confuse people here a little bit is when we start talking about AWS Fargate. Um, which is a container service that allows you to say, take this container, give it two CPUs and half a gig of RAM, yes. and please go run this container. And you don't care about the host, what it's running on, where it's running on, does it have capacity? It's just here, go run, thank you. And that one is also a per usage, which means as long as the container is up and running, per second billing kicks in, yes. as soon as you shut it down, it's gone again. But the important part there is the no host, no operating system, no maintenance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's kind of, kind, of a, kind of a big thing on that. and and. People usually associate Lambda functions with that. And, you mm. know, you're not wrong. You're not wrong that Lambda functions are kind of the 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 big star in the serverless world, right? Yeah. So that's, that's, well, that's what, what you started. think about. Yeah, that's where it started, right? So when I heard mm. when I first heard about serverless, and that was a few years back, I was working for AWS and you know, people started talking about serverless applications. For me back then it was just like, oh, I'll just run some code on a Lambda function. Um, but it has evolved. It has quite much yeah. evolved since since just being a, a serverless thing. So, Kobus, tell me tell me about your first experience with serverless. Have you ever built anything serverless? Have you used anything? Well, you have used oh, serverless yes. things, but show me, t tell yes. us actually. My 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 very first one was one of those fun things which have become very common nowadays, which is you mm -hmm. use a lambda function to do anything that <laughs> is not necessarily part of a service yet. Yeah. So I need to do something when something happens. So let's kick off a lambda and fix it. And in my case, what it was, it was a an auto scaling group with an Elastic IP, and I wanted to move the Elastic IP if the instance went down or came back up again, yeah. um, just because we wanted a single instance with that specific Elastic IP. So, um, and this was before you could actually attach an Elastic IP to load balancers or the network load balancer. So we had to do it manually. So very simple. Watch the um, CloudWatch events for when um, the auto scaling group said I scale up or I scale down. As yeah. soon as that happened, it would kick off the Lambda function. Um, and then just reattach that elastic IP, which meant that, yes, there was some um, downtime, obviously, because instance comes up, notification goes out, Lambda function runs, attaches EIP, there's a there's a gap there. So yeah. that, I think, was the very first thing that I did with uh, Lambda functions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, um, I, I actually, when I, when I first seen a serverless, uh, well, when I first used serverless or Lambda functions in this case, right? Um, it was for, um, it wasn't an application. So uh, I, I need to take you back a bit more. A bit more. Um, in my old system administration uh, times, I had, a, I had a dedicated virtual machine called a scripting server. Um, <laughs> it was a server where I would execute PowerShell scripts or batch scripts or, or, or any kind of script that I need to run against something else. So for example, I would have a script that could back up different servers, I would have it run on that server. So it was like, kind of like my automation engine for a lot of things. Mm. Um, and then, you know, when I started moving to AWS, and then I've seen like, oh, you can do that with Lambda functions. Lambda functions can execute any arbitrary code, well, most arbitrary code you give it, and do something mm -hmm. with it. So that was kind of my the Lambdas were the glue in my automation thing I was building. So um, mm. It was great because again, <laughs> there has been there there have been no web servers at all, right? Um, there mm. has been nothing to have to maintain storage or patch, login, whatnot. It was just a place I can just drop in some code, and 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 have it run. Mm. Um, Question so yeah. here from our audience, from Todd: What is a Lambda function? Um, and also, then is serverless something uh, like Heroku or Netlify? So let's tackle Lambda function first, and then we go on to actual serverless. So a Lambda function is a service inside AWS that allows you to write a single function at a time. And what that um, function then does is it's got some kind of trigger 
typically that's a an HTTP trigger. So you put an API gateway in front of it, which means that you expose that um, Lambda function as a HTTP endpoint. So anybody making a request to it with whatever the input parameters are that you have configured, that gets passed onto the Lambda function, and then that little bit of code executes. And it's actually one function at a time. So you can obviously make that function as long or as short as you want. Um, but as with all programming, you kind of want short functions that only do one thing um, instead of doing 50 million things with nested if else blocks. So the idea here is that while that code is executing, um, the timer starts and, and it does it in one millisecond increments. And as soon as that function finishes processing um, and returns a value, it stops um, counting. And that's how the billing works. So if you've, for example, got an API that isn't very busy, you're talking probably a few cents a month to keep it up and running. Correct. Yeah. So it's it's kind of a, an arbitrary way to run some code, and and we can go into details about how much code and what is all the things you can do in a lambda function, but imagine it as a, as a place where you drop your JavaScript code or Python code mm -hmm. or whatever, and you trigger it in some way. Now that way can yeah. be by an API call. It can be by something else happening somewhere else. It can be a REST API call to a gateway or whatnot. Um, and it will just do something, output something, or do anything. It's kind of like a you you give it code and don't care about it, right? You don't worry, yeah. you don't care about the operating system. There's no servers there. There's nothing for you to to think about that you need to maintain and manage. You, you literally just focus on the code, right? That that is the whole function. That's the whole point mm. of the lambda function. And lambda functions are kind of like the 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 core of serverless. Well, it is not everything that serverless yeah uh there's a lot more things when it comes to lambda functions mm. right so yeah and um quickly to continue up with todd's question about can i use javascript yes so out of the box a lambda function needs a runtime now aws provides a list of um runtime so for javascript uh, using node.js python java c sharp f sharp ruby go what am i missing Wait, let's there's a long list. So there's, there's, here's the, here's the long uh, list uh, of, 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 of things that are being supported. So yeah, um, yeah these are all the, all the latest supported languages directly in Lambda. Yeah. So, um, yeah, but .net. you're not limited to those. Absolutely. You can actually run what you want um, because you can build up your own base layer and then and with the runtime in it and actually execute that. I know um, is the, if I remember correctly, the Bref project is for PHP, the BREF. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, things like that. And um, I know people have even run Turbo Pascal in Lambda functions, <laughs> which is was, uh, quite some, impressive. Somebody made somebody made a Commodore 64 basic uh, layer for Lambda. <laughs> you can execute yeah. basic applications, which is fun. Um, but yeah, so in, in essence, when you go and create a Lambda function, you define what kind of language you want to use, and you basically just do that. You also mm. define, like, potentially some, like, uh, I don't even know what that is. Like, where do you define the the size of a lambda function the memory uh, um i think that's further up that's for, uh default yeah. executional no it's somewhere well, up there yeah so basically you define you you define mm. a runtime you say which language are you going to run here you define mm. the memory size you want and it's usually like 128 megabytes or 512 or whatnot and then you just give it some code and yeah just like that it runs your code mm. so yeah and that's 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 kind of one of the points of, of lambda functions and um just for those that are curious about this if you think about a, a specific function it needs some kind of memory overhead to run so yeah um the increments you have in lambda fun uh, for a lambda function is um i think it starts lowest is 64 megabytes was it 32 128 I, no, I think it's 128, 128. Oh, okay 128, 128. Yeah. 128 and then it can go up all the way to uh, a couple of gigs of memory yeah um, yeah and how it works is that in terms of like the price is uh, based on the amount of memory multiplied by the amount of milliseconds that the function is running. Exactly. Um, yeah. So, so in this case, there was a question here from, uh, uh, yeah, from uh, Muhammad. Uh, so, do we only pay when Lambda functions got triggered? Yes, that's yes. when it comes to Lambda that's functions. Right. You pay mm. exclusively when they're triggered and for how long they run. So, think of it this way: if you have this. Um, uh, if you have an application that runs only for a couple of milliseconds, you only get charged a couple of milliseconds, and that's you know peanuts. Yeah. Mm. Um, if you if you 
this kind of this kind of forces you to make good code. <laughs> you know, if you have a a, a bunch of sleep ah. statements in your Lambda functions, um, <laughs> <laughs> the good old job security one. Let me put a sleep in, it and then five months down the line, when I need to improve performance, I just decrease the sleep. Exactly. <laughs> so if you add sleep statements into your Lambda code. Uh, you will literally cost cost yourself more money. So be careful with yeah. those things. <laughs> mm. Kind of moves in um, that direction. And also just to clarify, um, and Doc, you need to correct me because this is the way I remember this, is that if you use something that has some kind of virtual machine that spins up to okay. actually run the code, like Java, like your JVM that spins yeah. up, then executes a code, um, we only charge from when the code starts executing and not for that spin up time. Correct. 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 Yeah. There is, there is mm. a time called a warm up. Um, so initially, when it comes to like when you run something like a Java application running in a JVM um, mm. on, on Lambda, it takes some moment to kind of spin up the entire thing and then starts executing your code. And that's that's the case yeah. if you're using the built-in um, uh, layers or built-in environments coming from us. We don't count the amount of milliseconds or seconds to spin up all that stuff for you. So it's mm. literally as long as your code is executing, which is yeah. just a wonderful thing. And and for those that are super curious about how it actually works deep under the hood, go have a look at Firecracker. Um, yep. It is AWS's um, virtual machine, uh, what do you call it? A virtualization engine. engine. Oh, it's the... Because basically, yeah, it doesn't yeah. use containers. It uses a, yeah. a micro VM, as we micro call it. It's like a, a yeah, really, really tiny. So it spins up an entire VM itself, has your code inside that with the runtime, executes it inside that VM, and then that VM yeah. is then deleted again afterwards. Um, yeah. But yeah. Yep. Yeah, so so it's 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 a very efficient way of doing it. And until recently, you would get charged in chunks of one hundred milliseconds, right? So yes. like you would run a script, and it's like hundred milliseconds. And if you go one millisecond above that, you get charged another hundred milliseconds, which you may think it's like okay, it's hundred milliseconds is not not a lot, but mm. we actually reduce the time from hundred milliseconds to one millisecond. So now you can even mm. more fine fine tune the, the the lambda functions. So mm. um, so yeah, that's kind of kind of one of the things here. Um, and I think just to clarify this, like billing perspective of this, like when we see a person or a company using Lambda functions and their bill is a couple of dollars, then it's a fairly large yeah. and active system. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cause it's like, and you get a large free tier. I think it's a million uh, gigabyte seconds a month. If I remember correctly. Yeah. But, um, but, but if, even if you go above like, like, I think like a million of invocations is like $2 or something like that. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's something, it's something very cheap. I, I have a friend mm -hmm. who, who owns a company that runs their entire application of multiples of thousands of users use their application and it costs them like $200 a year, something like that. It's ridiculous. <laughs> so it's nice. You, you get into such numbers. You're like, wow. How does it <laughs> so, work? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Mm. Um, so, so, I wanted to mention something here, but I kind of lost lost the. Uh, tra uh... I've got one. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so um, there's a question, but we'll get to that now. But this immediately leads to the next serverless type service that we want to probably talk about, which is Event Bridge, which is yeah. a super super useful toy. Um, basically, Event Bridge is a service that allows you to set up notification between AWS generated events. This was the first iteration of the service. We'll get to the enhancements just now. So what would happen is, let's say something happens in your AWS account, like uh, an order scaling group scales up, um, or someone, what what should we do, changes the security group rule or something. Yeah. What would happen then is that notification would be caught by EventBridge, and you can tell EventBridge, OK, now take this notification and route it somewhere else. Nice. And that somewhere else can be a Lambda function. Now, this then becomes interesting because now you can start reacting and do event-driven architecture. Yeah. And they released a feature fairly recently um, that allows you to register external webhooks as well. Um, and also the other nice part is that it's integrated with a lot of third-party services. So let's say Datadog, for example, or GitHub. You can actually set it up and say, listen, listen to GitHub or Datadog. Um, yeah. And as soon as something happens, they take that and then route it to your Lambda function, which means it only gets executed when um, that happens. Correct, correct. So. Yeah. There's a lot of different things around Lambda functions and a lot of different services and features that kind of make this entire serverless ecosystem. So uh, that's why we don't, you know, this is not to talk about what is Lambda. Yes, of course, we're going to talk about Lambda functions and why is it, why mm. and how how they work and how you should use them and all this stuff. Um, it's, but it's a lot of other things like EventBridge, like your SQS, your SNS, your mm. uh, state machines, your whatnots, right? But let me yeah. ask the question to the audience now. So, and, and this is always a hypothetical question I, I ask for people, especially <laughs> new people with serverless. If you need to build an API, let's say we need to build an application that just needs to be a REST API out there, 
and um, the REST API will just get a request, process some data, store it in a database, uh, uh, process an image, store it on a, on a file storage. How would you do it, right? How would you do it right now, right? Yeah. If you would ask me, I would look no further unless I have technical limitations than serverless. Because in, a, in this setup, I can literally spend almost no money, at least for the time, for the beginning, it would cost me almost nothing, where I would have a, a lambda, a couple of lambda functions that would do a bunch of different things. I would have an API gateway that would serve as a, as a front end or a, as the entry point to my users or, or, or whoever consumes the, this thing. And then to talk to an S3 bucket or a DynamoDB table or whatnot, it would all be in such built in such a way that I don't have to worry about a server, right? And I am a man who loves servers. I enjoy, I, I, I used to be a sysadmin. That was a thing that I loved, but I wouldn't go ahead now and like, oh, let me go and install Debian somewhere or, or Amazon Linux and let me just set up HTTP and, and oh, sorry, HTTPD and uh, Nginx and whatever, right? <laughs> because yeah. for a lot of the use cases out there, it's perfectly fine to use the serverless, right? So, mm. um, and I, I just want to make it clear that, that, when it comes to um, when it comes to people who are trying it out, it's not something vastly different. It's not something scary. There are different ways to approach serverless applications, but it's not something that's like, oh, it's blockchain or whatnot, right? So it's it's very much down to earth. It's very much mm. you know you will you will understand how it works in a relatively quick time. So. And it's very cheap, so you can play with it, try it, and you know, <laughs> all of those things, mm. definitely. Um, we've got a couple of questions here. Let me just scroll up. Uh, firstly, hey, Kanner, welcome back. And mm -hmm. yes, it is summer, as you can see, it's actually been some of this whole year yeah. for me so far. We're actually heading into <laughs> winter now, given that I'm in the Southern Hemisphere in Cape yeah. Town. Uh, Darko is apparently coming out of winter, although it doesn't quite yeah. sound like it. Well, um, yeah, it's, it's been cold for a couple of days here. So <laughs> we had minus two degrees yesterday in Berlin, Berlin so uh, yeah. Mm. Uh -uh. No, no, thank you. <laughs> um, and then we had some uh, questions here around GraphQL um, and how it accesses and uh, connects to things. So for those that are interested in uh, GraphQL, so GraphQL is an open source project that is focused on creating, I'm trying to think of what the generic description would be, a an, an API that you expose to clients, but they have the ability yeah. to define what they want to see and how they want to see it. So concrete example quickly is that if you've got a REST API and I've got an endpoint, let's use this old standard, uh, I've got a blog engine or yep. blog API. I can call the endpoint blog and it gives me a list of blogs. Then I can call a specific uh, blog with an ID and say, well, give, and then it returns the author, the title, the, what I say, the body, the meta tags, whatever it is. But that shape is fixed. It's got that endpoint and that's that. So if I need to do something on the front end where I need one entry or let's say a synopsis of each of these, I would have to make firstly a call to get the list of blogs. Yeah. Then I need to do multiple calls to say, get each of these individual uh, blog posts. So I can get that specific single value out. Or you can get the developer to go build a new endpoint specific for what you need in terms of how to view that. And this is kind of where, oh, we lost Darko. No, I'm back here. Um, my camera went away. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and where GraphQL comes in is like, you define how the different data sources look in the back end and how they are connected to each other. And then yeah. the client can actually specify what do I want to see. So then you can say, well, give me the blocks and for each blog entry, give me the title and let's say just the synopsis. Um, and it sends one query to the back end the back end or the GraphQL endpoint, and then that does the aggregation and collects all of the different things, shapes it, puts in the shape you want and sends back that one request. So if it speeds up the interaction from the client side, especially if there's a lot of latency. Yeah. I, th I think I think uh, GraphQL is a wonderful thing because uh, it allows you to have multiple different backend data sources, right? Mm. From your uh, databases to uh, an API, another API in the backend and GraphQL can basically be a single entry point for a lot of that things out there. So I, I think mm. I think GraphQLs are, while, while I'm no means an expert on GraphQL, I think they're just um, just a great way to get started with. Mm. And they are not necessarily part of the serverless world. You can use GraphQL quite outside of serverless, right? It's not... Yeah, it's if not you want to, but it's very yeah. common. Yeah, it's very common that in, in serverless applications, mm. people use GraphQL because it's just a simple way to have your Lambda functions invoke something somewhere, or, or even not like your clients at the end of the day, your front end applications mm. can also invoke, invoke uh, uh, GraphQL endpoints. 
Um, and also yeah. the, the same person who asked about GraphQL, Giovanni, uh, he asked, um, uh, do you need to be an expert in coding to use Lambda? Well, no, <laughs> you know, uh, it's uh, uh, as long as you know how to build applications and you're, you, you know, you're building things already, you should be uh, pretty easy on, on, on creating applications in Lambda. In Lambda. The, the only difference is like, when you approach to build a serverless application, you really need to approach it to as a as a as a microservice. And I, I dare to use the bad term called nano service, but like, try to not think of your application as this big old long PHP file that does a big thing. Think of it as small individual things that kind of are reusable and and can talk to each other, right? So think of it as a, as a big old cluster of microservices that communicate between each other. And instead of having containers or having servers running those microservices, you have the code just being executed somewhere, right? So that is that is one of the one of the points when building an application. So yeah. yeah. And um to the point here, um, I think it's uh, Boksha who said something um, about if it's multiple teams, then go so go for something else like, else like, for example, Kubernetes. And here the fun part comes in like with any kind of software, if you've got yeah. multiple teams and there's no strategy around where the code goes and where you put the code, then it will yeah. be chaos. So similar with serverless, if you are exposing a single API and it covers multiple different services because it's a microservice architecture, yeah build each of those microservices in its own project that gets deployed on its own and is grouped together. Um, because otherwise you will just have the same spaghetti mess that you have in other yeah. code where if it's all in one code base and it ends up. Yeah. Um, like, yeah. I, I'm, I'm more, more in favor of doing it like in a, in a very distributed way. Uh, so if you have a big team uh, and you are working on, on, a, on a single code base in like five files, um, then it gets complicated, right? Then it's like more, multiple people working on the same code at the same time or same modules or whatnot. If you have things in microservices, the beauty of, of having microservices, and this is just not nothing about Lambda per se, but the beauty about having microservices is the fact that you have this very separate thing that does a thing. And if you want to introduce a new feature, you create a new microservice or a, or a new version of that microservice that does it differently and then just implement it or re-implement it. So, um, you have mm. this very big freedom of, of, of doing all of those things. Right. So, uh, but yeah, uh, mm. and then, uh, um, the question here from, uh, Snevo Leet, uh, about if, uh, if you would recommend using serverless framework, f um, for smaller applications, actually for smaller, I would definitely recommend it. I mean, yeah. it probably gets you up and going within like one or two minutes. Yeah. Um, it saves you so much time. And even when you go to larger projects, um, think about how you compose them with different um, sub projects for each microservice. So that becomes a little bit more of a infrastructure as code discussion again, because you've got some part, let's say the API gateway is shared between multiple different services, yeah. then yes, you would have something create the API gateway and then the services reference that. And then you right. need to worry about how do we actually claim the specific endpoints yeah. or subdomains or however you want to slice this uh, piece of cake in terms of yeah. having fun with your services. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So it's, I, I, you know, you can create Lambda functions from the web console like I've showed you before, the the little mm. uh, wizard. That's how it's very easy to create a lambda function. But usually, a lambda function in itself lacks. You, it's not an application, right? You need a lot of different yeah. elements to make it an application. So things like a serverless framework, or a SAM, or CDK, or whatever kind of an infrastructure as code framework you would like to use mm. helps you with that because you structure your serverless applications inside of text files and those text files actually provision all those things, right? If you provision a, mm. a single Lambda function, you'll most likely provision an API gateway, most likely, right? So, uh, mm. or if you have multiples of them, you will most likely have a, a messaging system in between them. But yeah. Yeah. But, um, and I see, uh, I see, uh, uh, Pete Zerosh, Pete Zerosh uh, message here, uh, me messages here us that he loves uh, la uh, Docker Lambda containers. Yeah, you can basically package a co Docker container in a Lambda function now, uh, but the cold starts are a pain. So that's one of the things with Lambda functions. If you use your own um, runtime and if you use containers, you can get into the thing called the cold start. Mm. Now, coming from a serverless world, um, from, from a server full world, for me, when you say cold start and we say, like, oh, it takes five seconds to start up my Lambda function, I'm like, how long does it take to start a, uh, what did Jacobus work on? This Java, um, uh, what is the, what is the, you worked on this Java web, uh, uh, you were, JBoss? 
J Boss, yes, J Boss. <laughs> yes. Yes, and that takes like 40 minutes to start up, right? <laughs> no, 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 not 40. Okay, if you, if you really tune it well, you could get it down. And remember this more than a decade ago, down yeah. to like 30 seconds. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. But it's like, you know, starting up applications back in the day, your ISs and servers and all that stuff took mm. a long time. But, you know, when we talk about scale of Lambda functions, and imagine you having, you know, thousands of Lambda functions. And every time a customer starts them up, there's a cold start. There's a, there's a problem. It, they have to wait five seconds. And nobody wants to wait five seconds. So um, that's kind of a thing we, we have to worry mm. about there. So, yeah. Uh, oh, Dan MBA uh, shares a link here. Serverlessland.com is a great place to start when it comes to serverless. So make sure to check it out. S yeah. Or this is not the good link. This is the good link. Serverlessland.com. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, check it out. There's a lot of good resources on serverless there, mm -hmm. so pretty, pretty good. Um, okay. Yeah. Let's go. Let, ah. Let's try to answer one thing. Yes. We talked about what is serverless, but what is not serverless? Tell me, what is not serverless? Um, what is not serverless is almost easy. It's anything where you have to have something up and running, whether or not it hits, gets any requests. Correct. Or you need to maintain the operating system, or you need to patch it, or yeah. spend time on anything other than here's some code or here's some data. Please run or or store yeah. this for me. Um, so that's Correct. that would be my definition of it. If I have to yeah. thumb suck the not part. Yeah. A practical example is as Todd says, EC2. That's not serverless. It's a it's a virtual machine yeah. that you spin up. It sits there. It costs you money as it sits there. Um, even your RDS databases, right? Even though we like to call RDS like a fully managed thing, you don't have to touch it, but it's still a database somewhere. It's still running somewhere and it costs you money as it sits there. Mm -hmm. So that is kind of a, a different thing. And it's, we, we come into like very fuzzy descriptions, like is S3 serverless? It is, but it does cost you money as you store files on it. So, so, so there mm -hmm. are those things there as well, but yeah, your EC2 instances, there are not serverless. Um, your RDS databases are not serverless. Um, what else is on your Elastic with the, Cache no, 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 clusters? No, 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 with, with, with the caveat, Aurora serverless. Aurora exist. serverless, yeah. Okay, Aurora serverless Which is under is, RDS? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So Aurora serverless is serverless because it's a, land of, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a serverless database that doesn't run, doesn't cost you anything while you don't use it. Yeah. Where's my little thing? I don't have here. Unless lots you only pay for storage. <laughs> you only pay for storage, yeah. right? Mm. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So, for those that are interested in just quickly what Aurora Serverless is, is that we built our own relational um, database built for the um, for cloud, which means yeah. that we split the compute and the actual storage layers. So, storage is taken care of by something like S3, where yeah. so that it stores the data in at least six locations. Which means the data in, database engine itself is purely compute. It doesn't have to worry yeah. about uh, log replication. It doesn't worry about um, anything other than the write act. So when it says write, uh, it only gets act that it has written once it has written to four out of the six nodes. And um, right. those six nodes are spread between three AZs yeah. at least, which means yeah. that it doesn't need to worry about uh, log files, all those fun things, which means you can scale the compute up and down regardless of the storage because it doesn't have to quickly spin up a new server, replicate all the data, and then do the query. It can let you go more compute as soon as that's ready, yeah. hit the storage and there you go. Um, yeah. So yeah. just so, so, in a nutshell know, what it is. Exactly, exactly. But it's, it's a wonderful thing, I must say. Mm. Uh, to answer a question here from Pradeepa, um, uh, Pradeepa asks, can I assign an Elastic IP for Lambda? Um, no, Elastic IP, uh, Lambdas don't have IP addresses, at least not the exposed IP addresses per se. Yeah. You invoke Lambda functions by the means of a trigger and a trigger can be your API gateway. So your API gateways have an IP address, so they have something <laughs> exposed to the world, but it's not like a, a Lambda function in itself does not have an IP address. Right? So it, it's, it, it doesn't have, I, I, I dare to say it doesn't have a networking stack, but it does. So, but that's not how you interact with Lambda functions in this case. So, yeah. Um, yes. so, so yeah. But uh, as with all things, there are a way to do it. You can put a network load balancer in front of mm -hmm. API gateway and assign static IPs yeah. or elastic IPs to that network load balancer, and then the, the request passes just through that network load balancer directly to your API gateway. So Correct. there are ways of doing it. Correct. If you if you really need a static IP address in front of a Lambda function or mm. in front of a Lambda based application, in this case, <laughs> now I, I would I would you know there are use cases for that sometimes, but try to avoid them as much as possible because it introduces unnecessary complexity to a system that doesn't necessarily have to be that complex. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
so Bokyo also asked here, um, how do you choose between different serverless products? Something like Lambda versus ECS Fargate, let's say. This actually boils down to the to the wait, complexity wait, wait. of things. It depends, right? Uh, that's what you want, yep. me, want me to say? Oh, yeah. get, get, get your card, get your card. We need our props. I need my props. So, Bokyo, <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> this is this is my answer to you right now. Uh, but no, it really depends. It really depends on mm. how you how your application is structured, right? If we if we're talking about uh, um, a relatively complex application that needs to execute or run for a long time, it has to do something for a specific, more intensive amount of time, or you need more resources, or you need um, you need whatever uh, what is it called? Uh, um, you need a very custom runtime. You need to access the operating system for some reasons, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm. Um, that's when I would, sorry, if you or hardware, hardware yeah, you yeah, yeah, yeah. That's when I would talk about, hey, you know, your ECS slash Fargate. And here's a question for you, Kobus: Is Fargate serverless? From your perspective, yes, because yes. you don't touch the server at all. You just say CPU, memory, container, please yeah. go, and yeah. then it runs. So yeah, it's 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 different. Mm -hmm. In in this case, you pass it a container, you pass the Docker yeah. image, and it runs. Um, but in essence, it is serverless, right? So mm. <laughs> you don't have to care about the clusters underneath or anything like that. So yeah, um, there's a fair, there's an inflection point in terms of the cost um, because how it works is when you look at a let's say a typical serverless application which goes has an API gateway, so your requests come yeah. into the API gateway and they get passed on to the Lambda functions. The yeah. API gateway has got a cost per I think million requests that it serves um, that goes up, and there's an inflection point where if you're API gets busy enough yeah. um, and you don't perform a lot of processing, um, it gets more expensive to run it on serverless than it would be to have an application load balancer with um, EC2 instances behind it, yeah. um, which is an interesting point. But I mean, now we're talking millions of hits a second, uh, if I remember correctly, where that inflection point is. But also one of the other reasons is if you need something like, I need to run a GPU hardware to do a specific part of my code or something like that. or the other fun one, you need to execute for longer than 15 minutes because that's yeah. the timeout limit on Lambda functions. So those are the two main use cases. And Lambda functions can get really expensive if you if you run them for a long time. Oh, right? yeah. So mm -hmm. I've worked with people who had Lambda functions literally run for 15 minutes. And they were like, oh, Lambda is very expensive. Okay, so maybe the your use case is Lambda is not the right thing. So again, Lambda is not the be all end all mm -hmm. things. There are cases where you would run containers, where you would run your EC2 instances, absolutely, right? But uh, there's a lot of use cases out there that you can benefit from serverless and Lambda functions and DynamoDBs and your messaging protocols and all that, that kind of stuff can be pretty good. Um, mm. Let me just answer a couple of questions here. Uh, yes. Johan, Johan asked a question, how can we debug a cold start to see where time is spent? Uh, my good sir, let me direct you to AWS X-Ray. AWS X-Ray, our tracing service can actually break down all of the things that are happening in your Lambda functions. How long does the cold start take? How does long? How long does each part of your Lambda function execute? So make sure to enable tracing or enable X-Ray on your Lambda functions to do that. So that is a really good way to to find the bottleneck. What else um, do we have here? Uh, can I use Engine X and Node to create my own server? Yes, of course you can. I mean, there's nothing stopping you, but yeah. don't do it on Lambda. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, not only that, but I mean, if you want to use like one of the support languages, if you're yeah. starting a new project, definitely look at serverless first. The reason is Correct. that you now spin up a, a, an EC2 instance, which means you need to worry about, is that instance up or not? How do I get my code onto that instance? Yeah. How do I upgrade the operating system, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Then you have to worry about how do you expose it, uh, SL certificates, the list goes on and on. And then you're not even talking about highly available. Yeah. By the time you've written down that list, you could have had a serverless app up and running already, where you just write the functions and how yeah. it does and hit the deploy button. So, But I would really point you to like uh, AWS SAM, the serverless application model, or the serverless framework. They are mm. excellent frameworks to help you define serverless applications. And then you just worry about the code, right? You create, you explain what you want. You need a, a, a gateway. You need a, a deployment strategy, whatnot, and it handles all of that for you. So. Um, um, just, just do that. Have a piece of code mm. that wants to run, and just use a framework to deploy it to a serverless function. So that that is a uh, that that is a great way to do it. <clears throat> uh, John P, um, 
is that cost taking into account Lambda with savings plans? Are they save, are there savings plans? With uh, yes, there is. It's under the general compute one. Okay. Um, it includes uh, EC2, Fargate, and Lambda, as well as Lambda. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so um, yes, it does. Uh, so the the numbers we're talking about are without the savings plan. The savings plan, uh, for those not familiar, is um, basically we say I commit to spending two dollars a month on, yeah. or sorry, two dollars per hour every month on AWS for compute. And then what happens is you can get up to I think it's a sixty-six or seventy percent reduction yeah. in total cost. So if you know, for example, you use X amount of compute every single month, that's your baseline. You never drop below it. Yeah. Apply a savings plan, which means you commit upfront saying we will continue to use this level for the next one or three years. Yeah. Um, and then you can also choose either full upfront, half upfront, or um, nothing upfront. And then based on those selections, you get a, a very large discount on the compute because you know that's what you need. You're going to stick to that, which yeah. is awesome. So to, to do that, like think about... Uh, savings plans because you know savings plans and reserved instances if you're using servers those things can save you a lot of money but you need to mm. kind of be strategic about things okay i know yeah. that i have a static constant workload and you can potentially know that only after a while but once you do I'm like okay i'll pay up front or i'll do use a cost savings plan and just have it cheaper so so it can yeah. reduce your cost yeah. quite a bunch especially for for static workloads Mm. <laughs> so yeah a um, couple of comments here uh, from uh, da -da -da, from Todd um, Todd Howard is that Todd Howard uh, <laughs> uh, so does AWS DynamoDB is AWS DynamoDB a fork uh, from Elasticsearch no uh, DynamoDB is its own mm. NoSQL database so it is a it is a key value store database it's great it's serverless you, you basically just create tables and you work with it again it's a non-relational database so not all data is for NoSQL or non-relational databases. So, so make sure when you're building an application, see if you can if if not if a non-relational mm. database will do the thing for you, right? Um, but but yeah, if 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 it if it does perfect, if it doesn't, there's other options like RDS and Aurora Serverless that can help you with uh, transactional not, not transactional relational data. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, um, then can, can find that there's a video from twenty. 16 reInvent, I think, about um, okay. uh, DynamoDB. I want to see if I can mm -hmm. find it quickly. That, and then mm -hmm. if you want to follow someone on Twitter, go look at Alex Debris. Uh, yeah, Alex, Alex Debris is the author of the DynamoDB yeah. book. It's, uh, I think I it's only it, yeah. uh, an, an, a digital book, right? There's no physical yeah. book. So it is It is a really great book on on, on, uh, on DynamoDB, that, right? That so, person, so yeah. check out Alex Debris yeah. as well. Um, Okay, I will try and find that on the side quickly. Okay, okay. Link to the YouTube um, video, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll read a comment here by Kanir. Um, uh, Kanir says, I found CoBuild a great development environment for custom Lambda containers since it essentially does the same thing on demand with great logging and figure out your bottlenecks before going into production. Yeah, CodeBuild is also a, a, a thing here when we talk about CodeBuild and code services. They're all also serverless in essence, right? You don't have to care about them. So uh, things like... Um, um, Code commit, code build, code pipeline. For all of those things, you only pay as they run and while they're executing. So you don't have to care about it. You don't have to work, worry about it. So, so, so make sure to do that. Uh, yeah. Mm. Uh, search. For I just pasted. It's not. Uh, oh, I can't. I can't mind. That's just an error. So I pasted a video by Rick Hulahan. Yeah. Um, I can't pronounce his name. Apologies for that. Rick um, but he's the other person you want to look at if you want to learn about DynamoDB and how it's yeah. different, how you start building things. It's like, it is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So um, a lot of links today. So make sure to check them, out, uh, check them all out. I think they should all be uh, available on all the places. So uh, make sure to fo follow Alex Zabri. Check out the video uh, by Rick Hulahan. So yeah. Yeah. Um, mm. But <sighs> Docker, we don't, we've got our notes. I'm looking at them now and we've gotten the two things we need to tell people about. What? Oh, I'll yes. Give you a hint. So, okay. Um, <laughs> yes, you need to know about a couple of things. Um, number one, uh, there is a thing happening this week. And uh, if you follow us on stream, uh, you know that we like to talk about DevOps and and all the, th all the fun parts about it. And one of the big parts about DevOps is your infrastructure as code, right? Writing your infrastructure as mm. code. And one of the fun, amazing, popular uh, frameworks out there today is the AWS Cloud Development Kit, aka CDK. This week, on Friday, uh, CDK Day is happening. 
So uh, let me just grab a link. Um, yeah. So CDK Day is happening on Friday, the 30th of April. Make sure to go register. It's a full day of a lot of amazing content on the topic of mm -hmm. AWS CDK. So cdk.com, cdkday.com, make sure to go and check it out, register. There's over, over 3,000 people registered already. There's amazing speakers from AWS and from you know from the communities. I'm going to be speaking as well. So if you get the chance to listen to me <laughs> Here in we go. full speaking mode, let Wait, me show please. myself. I cleaned my desk. I don't have the stuff for my drawer anymore. <laughs> I need to bring that back. <laughs> we haven't used uh, <laughs> the, CD, the, the jar for a long, long time. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, CDK Day is a thing you need to also check out. So make sure to go and register if you're interested. Again, we have we have Eric Johnson. We have uh, Elad Ben Israel. Uh, uh, we have Natalia. We have, I'm reading all the folks here. We have Ansgar. We have Greg, Nick, Rajesh, Mark, Ben. A lot of folks out there who just will create, mm. do a lot of great deep dive content on AWS CDK. So yeah. make sure to check it out. So uh, um, uh, I'm I'm looking forward to seeing you all there. And it's free, of course. So uh, mm. it, it says get your ticket, but the ticket is free. So it just uses it. <laughs> I think, yeah, it uses it for it's like a virtual ticket. People. <laughs> it's a virtual ticket. So yeah, um, it's an all day event. So make sure to check it out. Hmm. Another thing we need to talk about is uh, get a link. Oh, this is now the promotion corner. We're going to lose yes. people. It's sorry. Not, we'll just take not, a minute or two. Yeah, we're just taking a minute or two. I'm trying trying to find the find the link to that thing. Um, uh, that thing would be the EMEA Online Summit. Is that it? Yes. Yes. Corbus, if you if you can find the link for a second. So, the, what is happening? Uh, I don't even know the date. What what date it is? It's. Um, we wait for the banner. Nine to ten June. There we go. Which one? It's nine to ten June. The online EMEA summit. I'm looking at a the, public page. Okay. The nineteenth of June. There we go. Okay. The nineteenth. No, no, of nine. June. Nine to tenth. Nine to tenth. Okay. Wow, that's a weird. Nine. Okay. So, space dash space okay. ten. On the 9th and the 10th of June, <laughs> there is an AWS online summit. So it's a virtual event uh, run by AWS. Yeah bunch of different tracks, bunch of different topics, you know, from your developer stuff to data analytics, to machine learning, to operations, to security, to all of those things mm. are happening on uh, the summit. So it's free. Uh, make sure to check it out. Uh, there is, uh, it's, it's actually coming in a bunch of different languages. We're going to have English, French, Italian, German, Hebrew, Russian. And... Uh, not Hebrew. Russian, yes, yes. Should... Polish, but not Hebrew from what I can see here. No, 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 they should not. Oh, okay. So there's going to be Polish. Oh, wait, the Boulder Day sessions. Uh... Yeah. Polish are going to, the Polish are going to have captions. You're going to have captions for Polish, but the, the, the ah. sessions are going to be delivered in Russian, Hebrew, English, French, Spanish, German, and Italian. So um, all of the major <laughs> languages, at okay. least in Europe, are going to be going to be part of that. So uh, make sure to go ahead and register. Uh, check it out. Um, we are looking forward to seeing you there. Unfortunately, neither Kobus nor I uh, are speaking there, but... But yes, um, mm. a lot of our fellow colleagues, fellow de developer advocates, and folks from around the AWS are speaking. So register, check it out. Uh, we hope to see you there as well. So um, end of, as Bokio would say. And, end of promotional period. Thank end you to our commercial, sponsors. Yes. Uh, <laughs> thank you to our sponsors, AWS. <laughs> they yes. are, they're literally our sponsors. They pay us monthly salaries. So um, yep. I guess. <laughs> we actually have a little bar then running at the bottom, like advertising saying for the entire duration of the stream. Because this... <laughs> and this is their Twitch channel, by the way. So, <laughs> ooh, ooh. Well, at least while we're allowed on it. Exactly. Um, sp speaking of, I see we've got 10 minutes left um, and I always leave this to the last minute. So for those that are interested in rewatching any of the old streams, we yeah. put them on our YouTube channel, which is aptly named Not Quibbers and Not Darko. Yes, they're above darker uh so have a look there if you want to go find it um or if you've got questions hit us up on any of the yeah. social links you can see below yeah. okay now we're really done with advertising cool yeah Let's okay get back no to more service. advertising so but there are a lot of content <laughs> we do streams every week well actually last week we didn't do a stream but we do yeah. streams almost every week uh and it's mm. usually the topic around uh devops uh, automation code and we call it dev beard ops because i think you can get it why but it's um it's the beard on the inside that counts. So uh, mm. that's that's important. You don't have to have a beard to be all yeah. that stuff here. Mm. Um, but yeah, uh, we have 10 minutes to go and we're not going yet. Why are you going? But no, no, stay. Yes. We have 10 minutes. Yeah. Come on. We're just wanting to show something before we go. Um, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> we are we are staying here. And as Kanir says, bear, dev bear dops. 
Uh, <laughs> um, we can do that as well. We can do that as well, whatever that means. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> Uh, I want to just address one last topic before we go. And um, mm -hmm. we kind of touched this on the, on the size and the complexity of Lambda functions. But when it comes to migrating things to serverless, mm. and we can talk about the whole thing la next, right? But one of the common questions I get when talking to customers is like, um, what, how do I, as a customer, how do I, as a, as a person who has an application running on a server, in containers, whatnot, how do I take that application and make it serverless? How does this migration process go? So it's not left and shift. It's not left and shift. Yeah, you cannot just, you know, when you were moving from your on-premises system or, uh, you know, your data center to the cloud, you can literally just lift your entire application and put it in different virtual machines in the cloud. That just mm -hmm. works. When we're talking about migrating to a serverless application, that requires some refactoring. Um, mm -hmm. It yeah. requires you to make your application serverless. That's why serverless yes. is not just a platform you run things on. It's a it's an all the things around it, right? So yeah, but um, so I, th I think we'll news. Leave... yeah, they're good news. Yeah, it's it, you can kind of do it. Sl I, I've actually so the, one of the, one of the best ways I've seen people do it is actually take chunks of it. Um, they would perform like a lift and shift on the cloud, and they would have their stuff running on EC2 instances. But then they would start slowly eliminating parts of that application into microservices. And instead, instead of creating that microservice on an EC2 instance or running somewhere on a container, they would make it a Lambda function, right? Mm. And then slowly just chip away your big old monolith into smaller microservices and just have those microservices run as a Lambda function, right? That, that's one of, the, one for, of the ways I've seen people do it. And for bonus points, do you know what that is called? No. I'll give you a hint. Strangling? <laughs> Suffocating? <laughs> yeah, very close. The strangler pattern. Strangler um, pattern? Oh, Refer okay. to like with, um, like with vines that strangle something and then breaks it apart. Okay. Ah. Um, yeah. So basically what, what you would do is, is, let's get into specifics here is, and we can talk about this at detail later, is you put a elastic load balancer or application load balancer in the front, Everything yep. goes to your old app. You put out a single function as a serverless function yep. uh, or Lambda function. And now what you do is on your application load balancer, you change the path to direct it to that Lambda function Correct. for just that little bit yep. instead of the rest. But yep. that is next week. We will not yeah, we'll talk about the details now. We'll talk about that later on. But to be honest, like once you start doing it, once you start, and uh, mm. it's very important for all of you folks who want to migrate an application to a serverless, don't try to, as somebody said to me, eat the elephant. Big bang releases. Yeah, don't go slowly, do little things, you know, uh, slow and steady. Uh, we like to say uh, the quiet river destroys a hill. So uh, just just t take it slow and steady, take a little bit of the time. And as we, as, as Kobe said, the strangler pattern uh, is one of the things that can help you out on that. Mm. So, um, yeah, I think we will add, end our serverless chats today on this topic mm -hmm. right now. Next time, and actually next time is going to be next week again. Uh, but I next think it's going to be, it's going to be, I think one hour early. Oh, uh, yes, there was something coming up. There was something coming up on that. Yeah. Yes. So it's going to be one hour early. So it's going to be at the same time, sorry, at the same place, but at 12 o'clock, 12 noon hmm. Central European time. Yes. I unfortunately have a thing at one o'clock. So my camera went away. Um, wow. Yeah. So, <laughs> so yeah. Next week we're going to talk about a bit more on on the topics of how to migrate your, or actually how to strangle mm -hmm. your application <laughs> and move it and move it to a serverless thing. So yeah. So yeah. make sure to join us there on the, on that time. Yes. Okay. With and that being with said, that, do we have any more questions? Yeah. Uh, if you have any questions, quickly, because um, this is so. So John we P asked, have a few minutes, which is weird. Yeah. Oh, by the way, um, we have somebody asking a question called Fubar Serverless. I don't know who that is. Um, uh, so this... I don't is... know, hey. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, definitely Marcia. You are going to do, contribute to the self-promotion job because I'll give them your YouTube channel yeah. link. Um, Marcia, uh, Fubar Serverless, is our colleague. She runs a YouTube channel called Fubar Serverless, and she talks about all the things serverless. And her videos are just amazing, short pieces of content yes. that tell you a lot about serverless on either year. So... Make sure to go and subscribe, smash the like button, I guess. I don't know. Uh, something. Doc, just... Doc, you're, you're doing it wrong. 
You have to show hello world. Hello I world. I can't, I can't do the Marcia yes. voice. I can't and do the excitement that oh. she has. It's like, uh, no, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> hello world. No, no, no. no. I, I, I miss, I miss the, the Marcia voice. So if you want to see what the Marcia voice is and what Marcia intro is, Fubar Serverless, there's the YouTube channel. Smash the subscribe and all the stuff. So yes, Marcia, we're ending. Yeah, we started uh, an hour ago. So, but yeah, um, mm. go here. And I think there's a better link, but it's in the chat. Ooh, yo, this is a, yeah. Okay. <laughs> but you can literally just go search for Fubar, um, YouTube Fubar, and you'll find her. Exactly. You'll find her. She has a lot, yes. a lot, of, a lot of followers, and a, lot, a lot of subscribers, a lot of videos. So mm. uh, all the recommendations. A lot of content, more importantly. Yeah, good content. So yeah. Um, yes. And with that, we want to say goodbye today. Unless there's more questions, we should we should try and bribe her to come on the show with us next week. Hmm. Marcia, would you like to come to the show with with us next week um, at twelve CET European time? Let us know if you have time. We can we can uh, in the comments yeah, down below. In the comments down below. Um, <laughs> yeah, we're gonna try to get Marcia on show because she lo knows a lot of us, a lot of serverless, and we can mm. get her here to talk about how to migrate things to serverless. So, yeah. Mm. Uh, <laughs> but uh, everybody here on stream, uh, make sure to. Hit the follow button, subscribe on, on our and Marcia's channel as well. If you want to see the previous videos, they're just up here on the Not Cobus, Not Darko YouTube channel. Um, uh, if you want to get more of, of this and that, um, we have our... <laughs> just search for us on Twitter and LinkedIn. We're available there. You can find us, I think, on any social media. MySpace maybe as well. I don't know. Um, so we're, we're all there. We're open to questions and, and comments. So uh, we are happy to hear from you mm. as well. Thank you very much. Cool. And I am. And it's time to it. end the stream. Uh, oh, wait, 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 wait. We've got a minute left. The, the, my bear joke that I have. So, a bear walks into a bar. The, bear the barman asks bar. him, um, what would you like to drink? And the bear goes like, mm, I'll have a beer, please. And the barman goes, sure, no, no worry. Beer's your beer. But um, just one question. Why, why the big pause? What these? I've always had them. <laughs> cool. There's your random beer joke for the day. And with that, cheerios, people. I've broken darker. We'll see you uh, next week. Bye. <laughs> Bye.